Oh, you better continue. Hi, and welcome to the Starseed Kitchen podcast. I'm your host, Chef Whitney Aronoff. And today with me, I have Chris Martin. Hi, Chris. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm excited to do the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I think you've been supporting me as a personal chef for like two and a half years now, right? Yeah, at least. And plus before when I was in meat long ago. Yeah. So I think actually, I think I've, I've known you now for like five years. Yeah, for I've sure. been shopping, yes, uh, shopping at your grocery store for a long time. Well, let me share um, a little bit about your background before we jump, in jump into things. Chris Martin has been working with meat and fish for 20 years. He has worked in leadership positions and as a trainer in both meat and seafood for several companies, including Ralph's, Stater Brothers, Albertsons, The Meat House, and several Whole Foods market locations. Chris is an expert in helping you understand how to order fish and where it comes from. Prior to working in the grocery retail business, he was a teacher. He was taught all levels from preschool to junior college. Chris is currently the seafood department manager at a well-known grocery store in Southern California. And with his teaching background, <laughs> it is so perfect that you educate us today so we can become better informed consumers and you know, much easier to work with when we are ordering fish. It, it helps the, the, the teaching background helps, you know, in the job, especially Absolutely. when it's something as complicated as seafood. Well, and hopefully I, I, you definitely have the patience um, because <laughs> I know uh, it's really easy to get worked up when you're trying to order, order something you don't understand. And um, right. everyone has different ideas of what certain food and cuts are called. So yes, I'm so happy to have you on here today. Perfect. All right. So tell me, tell us a little bit more about um, kind of what you've been doing in the meat and fish departments over the past few years. Uh, well, um, I started out in a Ralph's um, just out of necessity. Uh, some time ago, I had some experience with Ralph's in high school, and then I went back to it because it's what I knew. And then I kind of just started working the whole store, different departments, but I came to the meat and seafood department and got taken under the wing of a, a meat manager who who's really cool I'm still in touch with today as a matter of fact it's, he's really cool he, he had a, a good impression on me and he showed me a lot of things taught me a lot of things and just his customer service and his knowledge about the product um, and all the things he taught me I really appreciated and I, I kind of took interest in it you know growing up as a as a child I fished a lot and I worked on a farm I uh, in high school, I was in the FFA, the Future Farmers of America. No way. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So like I slaughtered my own animals and, and grew gardens and sold meat and vegetables and I sold eggs in the neighborhood. So it's kind of always been all around. So yeah, um, going into the grocery retail business and just knowing the product and the animals, always wanting to learn. It's just an exciting field for me. Um, so it just grew from there. I, I was at that store and then went to another store store and then the meat house opportunity came along which is like a boutique uh, high-end meat and cheese and wine and I know you're familiar with that store and um, I was a general manager of one of those and learned a lot more and then came back to uh, the store where I am now the company working for them um, in all aspects not just in one spot but in being able to train yeah. <clears throat> other teams and leaders um, it's been a good opportunity for me. So, you know, I'm good where I am. I know a lot about the product. And, and so I think I need to stay here and, and teach people about the product. Yeah. And that's what you do a really great job of. And that's why it always brings me so much joy when I see you at the store <laughs> almost daily, because I know I can rely on you if I have any questions that you can give me the honest answer. And I really appreciate that. Well, that's the crazy thing about everything not just seafood but food in general like for yeah. me like I don't know a lot about cars and so when I go to the mechanic or I'm going to go get an oil change I have to trust that the dude is telling me the truth you know like, oh, you need an air filter or you need to, I I have no idea whatever you say I you know I'm trusting that it's correct and it's the same with you coming to see me or any customer like yeah. you don't know what I have you don't know where the fish is from you may know what you want 
but you're not exactly sure what's the best thing to get. And so building that rapport with your fishmonger or your meat guy, it's kind of important because you have to trust me or whoever you're dealing with behind that counter to, yeah. to ensure that you're getting a, a quality product. Absolutely. And I think, I think some people have discernment when they walk up to a counter, visually they can see what's fresh and what's not fresh, but not everybody can, can see it that way. Some people really can't tell um, for a variety of reasons what is fresh and what is ready to go out the door. Um, and so <laughs> they really do, they really do require people like you to, um, to be able to give them um, the honest truth and help guide them on their purchases. So thank you. Well, that whole fresh term, we got, we got to talk about that because okay. when folks come to me and they'll ask me, is it fresh? That, that question bothers me a little bit, only because there are two things. Number one, I'm not allowed to put something that's not fresh into the case. So if, in, if it's in a case, assume that it's the best product that I have. I'm not going to put out something that's old, even if it's a day old or half a day old, if it doesn't look good at my particular company, I'm not allowed to put it out. Okay. So I can't put it out. And secondly, the word fresh to me and to meat guys means that it has never been frozen. So if you ask me if it's fresh and it's shrimp, I'm going to say no, it's not because it's been previously frozen. So I think terminology is a huge, huge thing at the counter. And just okay. know that like yeah. you may see something and it might not look the greatest, and you can always suggest, oh, you know what? I'm not very happy with that piece. Can I have another piece? But just know that everything on my pan that I chose to put out, um, me personally, for sure, but it's supposed yeah. to work that way for everybody. It has to be the best that I have that day. Got it. So just so we can help the consumer better understand. Um, and because I'm curious if this is true. So when I was in culinary school, they told us that basically nothing is fresh from the sea unless you caught it yourself. That by law, all the boats have to immediately put the fish on ice and certain things need to be immediately flash, flash frozen on the boat. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. So not everything is frozen, but everything is put into a deep chill. So because it can't sit on, the boats are not returning as soon as they catch a few fish. They're gonna be out there all day. So it's gonna to have to be deep chilled. And that's because all of the uh, raw products and raw materials, they have to be kept you know, out of the danger zone with a cooking danger zone I know you're well aware of. So it's gonna to have to be below 41 degrees and it doesn't have to be frozen, but it has to be kept below 41 degrees and it has to be brought down to that temperature within a certain time frame. Mm -hmm. So there goes another thing, like you have to trust that I'm keeping my fish below 41 degrees all the time. From the time I get it from my back dock till the time it's in my cooler, I'm moving it in and out of the case. Like you're really trusting a lot at the yeah. seafood counter. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so somebody catches our fish. They're usually out at sea for all night or all day. Um, once it comes back into the dock, what's the process of it then getting to our grocery store? So there's a number of different processes and it all depends on the particular fish. There's just several different areas where the fish comes from. It used to be most of it went to the LA fish market and people would come and pick and choose which fish they want. But it doesn't happen like that for us at, at this point anyway. Um, fish gets flown in from faraway places like Iceland or Greece. We get fish flown in from there um, and those trips typically are, are overnight, but they take several hours, as you know, to get from those countries to us. Wow. Um, then fish is also brought in from a number of uh, private fishers that we work with. We work with folks that, like the guy that catches our, our black cod or our sable fish, like we know him by name. He catches our fish. His boats bring the fish to us and, you know, we pick and choose them. And then other fish, it just goes to um, our distributors that we use. Um, they, they source the fish from wherever, and then we pick through it what we want, and it comes to our store. So the, the crazy thing is things like, like in the meat, things like lamb that comes from New Zealand, yeah. it's going to take like eight months before it even gets to the store because it has to sit in lockers for a certain amount of time. It has to go, and it comes by ship, not by plane, and they have to wait. Wow. So it's crazy. To, to, that's why when people say, well, did this come today? 
they always ask me, did this fish come today? The answer might be, yes, it came today, but it was sitting in that cooler in my warehouse for two days before I got it. And wow. just the same amount of time as the fish I got yesterday or the day before, it's the same age. It didn't, I didn't catch it, get to the dist distribution center and get to my store all on the same day. That didn't happen. Wow. So that's why when I buy fish, I really need to cook it within 24 hours. Yes. I mean, it's kind of like, and that's it. You, you can, you can keep it. Like if you have to remember like a long time ago before like refrigeration and stuff like that, we would eat stuff, you know, seven days old or whatever you can, you could eat anything, right? Like they asked me, well, how long can I keep this in my fridge? I have to say like three days maximum. Yeah. But in my, I'll eat stuff. If it's a week later, as long as I'm keeping it proper, but you have to know that once the oxygen hits it, you know, it's going to diminish in quality um, and it's going to diminish in taste. It's not going to harbor any more bacteria if you're keeping it, you know, in a proper temperature. It's not going to get new parasites because the fish is going to have parasites already. It's not going to get any, that's not happening, but the quality of the product is diminishing and you can get bacteria growth if it's not in temperature. But it's now, not going to kill you if you eat it five days instead of two days. That's really interesting. So why does it smell worse five days later than it does on day two? That's because it hasn't been, unless you have some kind of pro refrigerator, that refrigerator is not maintaining your product at the optimal temperature like you think it is every time somebody opens the door. And sometimes my refrigerator doesn't even close all the way. And I look and I go, oh crap, it, it's not even close. Yeah. So, and there's stuff in there. So as that's happening, what's happening is that product is breaking down. The proteins in that meat are breaking down and they're gonna start letting off gases like ammonia and stuff like that, that you smell. And that's what you smell like. Fish shouldn't smell. When they say fish shouldn't smell, it's because if it does, that it's had time to break down um, in the oxygen. And when you smell like a seafood counter, like when you go to a store, like I'm always upset when my seafood counter smells bad because it's not the fish that smells bad. It's that it underneath, it didn't clean it well. So if my night guys or something didn't clean it well, maybe there's a shrimp down there or something. And then that's what you smell. Then everybody's like, oh my God, your fish is horrible. Like Got so. it. Yeah. And when I come to your counter, it never, ever, ever smells. It better there's not. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely places I've walked into before and yes. you're horrified by the stench. Yeah. If you can smell the seafood counter when you walk in. Yeah. You probably don't want the seafood. And it's not, I guess it's probably not their product. It's yeah. probably their case. But if their case is not clean and that's telling me something about how they're maintaining the product, if they're not maintaining their case and it's probably not very good. So when you first transitioned from meat to fish, what were the things that you learned that really surprised you? As just a, when, when you think about it as a consumer and someone that eats fish and shellfish, what did you learn that kind of sh shocked you and you wish you had known sooner? Well, not that I didn't know, but how important it is the, the shelf life of the fish. It's so much more delicate than the meat. Mm -hmm. and keeping it separate we have certain rules on where certain fish can be and you know how long it's going to last and so it becomes very difficult to order because I'm going to throw away fish that's just going to happen and I don't want to do that so I have to make sure that I'm ordering this delicate product that's going to have a short shelf life and knowing how much I'm going to sell um, it's kind of like a a really difficult dance to make. So that's the one thing in that transition that was a lot different. Um, and I should have been prepared for it, but I wasn't. It was kind of, it was, it was something new to learn. So what happens when you have to, what happens when fish is old is, I mean, is the option is just the trash. So here's a couple of things that happen. Number one, I've been in companies that will sell the fish for one day and then marinate it to because it's not going to look great to get a couple extra days out of it the company i work for right now we're not allowed to do that so all of our marinated stuff is cut from the fresh fish that we get in so that kind of sucks because some people who've been to other markets they'll they'll know it as that so they'll be like oh your marinated stuff is old no it's not it's, it's really fresh so um, but when the fish does get old and it's on its last leg and we're going to throw it out, there's a couple of things you could do. It can either be cooked 
and sold as a cooked product. So if you have an out in the store where say um, prepared foods or we used to have a big salad bar where we could make salads and stuff in the store, all that stuff. Um, or it can be donated. We do have a, a company that comes to our store every day and they take donations from every part of the store. And if it's something that's good enough that I can get to them that they can freeze, then they'll take that. Or if it's a frozen damaged product, they'll take that. And they're right across the street. So it's a cool company. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's really nice yeah. to hear. The, but the bad thing is there's a lot thrown out. It's really important to order correctly and to sell properly. And then you've got folks I think a lot of folks come to the fish counter thinking it's like a restaurant. You know, when I'm at a restaurant, I'm getting like a six ounce piece of salmon that's pretty uniform, but it doesn't come like that. So, but that's what they're gonna ask for. So all the rest of it is gonna get thrown away. And so I've seen that starting to drive up costs because, mm. you know, we're not able to use the whole animal and we should be using the whole the whole animal. We do cut, you know, we'll cut our salmon tails off because most people don't want the tails um, and we'll I'll, grind I'll it. take your tails. Yes, they're the best part. I don't know why people don't want it. Yeah, I like the thinner piece anyway. So yeah. I'll start, I'll start asking for the tails for myself so I can help your cost um, yes. and I'll save the pretty pieces for my clients. Yes, there are no bones in the tail. Um, it's a better piece. I've heard people say it doesn't, it doesn't cook right. And I always think you don't cook, right? That's the, yeah. it cooks the same. It cooks faster. Yes. You just have to know how to cook. Yeah. And I actually think I prefer it because it cooks faster. And like, yes. for instance, if we're going to talk about salmon, I like my salmon cooked all the way through. I'm not someone that likes it a little raw. Yes. So I think the tails are great because it's easier to cook it all the way through. And then it's great to just, you know, if you don't want the skin to peel it right off the skin and, you know, put it in a taco, you know, put it in a tortilla for a taco, put it on a salad, eat it as is. It's great. Yes, I agree. So good. I'm going to chalk you up for some tails next week. <laughs> okay. So what's the best time of year for me to have salmon? Well, really now um, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of all year, which we're seeing. Um, like I just got a shipment of fresh wild king salmon today. Typically there's a season for like yes. wild salmon and that is not now um but what's happening is there are fisheries that are over full and they have opportunities to release some fish from that fishery because it's bad for the habitat if they don't and so they allot a number of fish to be taken even though it's out of season um to distribute to the stores like that so that's why you'll see every once in a while they'll pop up i don't like it when it happens because it you know, it's kind of misleading to the consumer. Like I've been yeah. telling you all year long, you better get your wild salmon now, or it's just going to be a previously frozen one. And now I've got fresh ones. in. so it's kind of weird, but yeah. Um, if you want the farm raised salmon, of course, year round, or you don't have to worry about seasons for that. But if you want wild salmon, um, you've got to look to this right. It just ended right about now. Um, it should go April through, um, like now, like February, January, February. So let's talk about what's really happening with farm fish versus yeah. wild fish. Because <laughs> I think a lot of people really think wild is wild. And from what I was educated with in culinary school, there's a lot of fake wild fish. Um, and then I think there's a lot of different things happening in the farm fish. Um, so let's, let's kind of try to break that down the best that we can. Okay, for sure. So I get a lot of folks that want only wild caught fish. I don't know why this is, but something's out there telling them that the wild fish is better. And in my opinion, it's not better at all, but there's a, a couple of things that happen. So the farm, let's talk about the farm salmon for starters. Uh, the farm salmon um, is, is a highly sustainable animal because we're farming it, right? So that, that's a good thing. And we'll have to talk about sustainable later, but that's a good thing. Uh, people talk about, oh, I don't like um, that there's color added. So, or they think that the farm, uh, the animal is like raised like in a bathtub or something like that, or in a box. And that's not the case. So the farm salmon, the farm that we use, um, they have floating nets in the natural environment where the animal lives normally. They're, these nets are large. They have a lot of room to swim around. 
No, they're not eating uh, like the crustaceans and the fish. They're not capturing them on their own. That they're put into a pellet form uh, by the farmer um, to feed multiple salmon at one time in a pellet, but it's the same stuff. It's just pulverized crustaceans and minnows and stuff that they're eating naturally. So the color added uh, that's happening now is the, um, the carotenin that is put in, that comes from like crustaceans and algae and stuff that they eat. I call it, um, I call it like carotenoid because it helps me remember that it makes a carrot type color. Yeah. But that's a pigment that's in crustaceans and small fish and algae or shrimp that they're going to eat, right? So the salmon, if they're not swimming around eating that stuff, some salmon, um, like there's, their meat would be gray. It would be not pleasant to look at. So it's not particularly the Atlantic salmon that's farmed that's gray. It's any salmon that's not going to eat that stuff. Right. So if they're the wild salmon is eating a whole bunch of it, especially the areas where they go to spawn, they're fattening up, they're eating a lot of it. So that's why they get that color. Some wild salmon, as you know, because I know you bought some, yeah. it doesn't have that color uh, like the, the ivory king salmon. Yes. And that's just because they have a recessive gene. They're not able to uh, store that pigment into their flesh like the other salmons do. So they're white in color. Um, but the farm salmon, they're getting this color added in. There's two ways they can get it. They're getting it either by in their food because they're smashing up the same food. So they're getting it. They may just not be getting as much as the wild salmon or that's become a huge market to where they're actually creating um, this uh, a chemically grown um, carotenoid that, that they'll put into the food. Um, it's actually the most expensive part of raising that farm salmon more than anything else is just that that color because and it's all just consumer driven it's all just because people think that the salmon needs to be orange or bright red to be good it's just not the case but um the the farm that we use they're just putting it in the feed they're crushing the animals and feeding it to them and that's where they're getting their color from but sometimes you've seen our farm salmon sometimes it's not super bright orange some kind of kind of dingy ish they're just not getting as much of it, but. But I prefer that because sometimes I go to markets and it looks fake. Like it's too bright, yeah. Yeah, it looks super artificial and like it's made in a factory. And that's, you know, that's where it makes you think of the artificial crab and you're just like, no. Yeah, you have to remember like, these are animals and, and every animal is gonna look different on the inside. They always wonder why it's not uniform. It's just not uniform. They're gonna look different. Some are gonna be lighter, some are gonna be darker. Yeah. that's just how how they grow so um also with the farm salmon like even though they're in floating nets in their natural environment the water is tested regularly and controlled like we know the water temperature we know how you know the salinity of the water it's it's the perfect water we know if there's a sick animal any sick animals are removed from the farmed salmon we know if it's an elderly animal if it's an old animal it's going to be removed so it's kind of like a zoo in the sense that you're getting the best specimen you could possibly get. Whereas the wild fish, I have no idea what the water was like where it was swimming. I don't know if it was swimming in polluted water or it was eating toxins. I don't know what it ate. I have no idea. I don't know if it's sick when I catch it. It could be a sick fish. If you ever gone fishing before and caught a fish, you don't know if it's sick or not. It's the same with our wild salmon. We don't have people, they just catch it and they ship it. You know, I don't know if it's old. It could be a super old fish. The wild fish could be. So for all those reasons, like I'm okay with the farm salmon and wild salmon is some of the most uh, parasite infested fish that I carry. It, it, it's got a lot of parasites in it all the time. So I don't know. And everything else in our store, for some reason, it comes from a farm and nobody has a problem with it. But the seafood, like the produce, everything in the produce department comes from a farm. Everything in the meat department comes from a farm, right? So yeah. no one has an issue with that. They're not saying, well, I just want those wild strawberries that are on the side of the road. Let's stop and pick some of those. You wouldn't do that because you have no idea what's on it. You want the ones that are raised by the farmer that says, oh, I didn't put any pesticides or herbicides, you know, all of that. That's a really good point. So what was helpful for me that I learned is that 
your source for wild salmon comes from a real stream or river. That's where they're living with nets in that area. That for the farm a, salmon, you said the wild for the salmon. Farm, sorry, for the farm salmon. Yes. It's not coming from some artificial no. um, pool that's put in the middle of nowhere. That doesn't happen that much anymore. Yeah. That is so hard to find some farm fish that do that. Even like you think about, oh, I, I went to some market that, you know, nobody hardly knows. I'm, I'm sure they got it. It's not easy to find poorly farmed fish anymore. It's all in those floating nets. And I, people say, oh, well, they're eating. I heard they eat the poop, you know, of the other fish, like the tilapia. They're underneath the fish and they're eating the poop. But I'm telling you right now, I just may come as a shock to you. But the fish in the ocean, the wild fish, they too are eating poop. <laughs> they're eating yes. poop. And the gasoline from your boat that just went by. You yes, know, my daughter was in the Navy. Your jet ski. You would be surprised to hear what she said happened with her aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. Where yeah. All that stuff went. No, growing up, because I grew up here in Laguna Beach, and I would go down to the beach on the rocks and the tide pools, and I'd collect the flaked sea salt, I'd collect the mussels, I'd collect the seaweed, and oh. I'd ask my dad if we could eat it, and he said, absolutely <laughs> not. Look whose boat's going by. He's like, you're eating the gasoline from those boats. And oh, those yes. Seas. He's like, you can't consume this stuff. Yeah, you know, the plastics have become a big problem. And that's another thing people talk about with the wild versus a farm is PCBs, which are, um, you know, and they're small micro type plastics that just go into the sediments and, and then the small fish eat them and then the big fish eat the small fish and then we eat the fish. And, you know, we're, we're pulverizing the feed, the smaller fish to feed the farm salmon. So there have been studies that show, you know, they have a lot of PCBs because they got all that. but there's real no study to show me how much the wild salmon is eating. They could be eating more. Yeah. They could be eating less. It's very difficult to measure that. But to me, it's available to them. It's their diet. They're going to eat it. So to me, you're going to get the PCBs either way. I just would rather do the farmed salmon because they say that doctors say that it's healthier. I know that my farm salmon and my wild salmon have virtually the same amount of omega-3 fatty acids. So That's to me, I'm going with the safe route. Well, I don't, I'd like to know, because you mentioned that salmon is one of the fish that has a large amount of parasites. Um, what yes, if my wild chef, salmon. Yeah, wild salmon. <laughs> well, one of my chef mentors told me that she worked at a restaurant for many years um, and the swordfish, the big pieces of swordfish would come in and she'd slice it open and it was littered with par parasites and sometimes they find trash in the belly. Absolutely. You, you'd be shocked at all the stuff I find in these animals. And nobody wants to talk about it and, that, and that's fine. Yeah. But they, they just have to understand that what they're eating, it, it's a fish um, and they have a lot of parasites in the ocean. Um, the freshwater fish, not so much, but they do tend to have it. And the bigger the fish, and the more chance you're going to have more parasites. And I see parasites all the time with my fish. Sometimes people will take it home and they're appalled that they see there was a, there was like a worm in their food. I'm like, dude, it happens. Yeah. I've heard a lot of stories like that, um, especially with fillets at restaurants and they're taught to, if you're a line cook in the fish section, you're told that if you see that worm come out of that fillet, you just put it right down on the flat top and yep. cook it and cook it down. <laughs> That's how it works. They're yeah. in there. We, we try to get them out as best we can. You know, they're going to be in there. Wow. Is this something that is, it's just always been that way or is it just getting worse because our waters are more polluted? Oh no, it's always been that way. And it, yeah. it doesn't really have anything to really do with the pollution. These are like animals. They're like nematodes and round worms and they're going to get eaten by the little fish and they're going to embed themselves in a little fish. You know, wow. little fish is going to get eaten by the big fish and then it tends to live in the fat. So the fattier a uh, fish um, wow. had that, you know, in that fat pocket, you get yeah. that. And then that's how it transfers to us. But when you think about it, it's very rare to get like a fish parasite. Or it, if you think about a place like Japan, that is a massive country that eats a lot of raw fish um, yeah. and they're eating big tuna and stuff like that. It, they don't have that many cases of food, but they have about a, like a 
thousand per year. I think one stat I read for a country that's that large, that's minuscule. So you'll probably never get a, a fish parasite or a sickness from a fish in your lifetime, but it can happen. So people need to know about that. So it sounds like freshwater fish, I'm least likely to get a fish <laughs> with the parasite. And that would yes. be trout, bass, yeah, and your trout, and even these these farm salmon, they spend some of their time in the fresh water. Um, they go back and forth. The farm salmon, you're not going to get a lot of parasites in. Uh, we used to carry a lot of other like paichi and stuff. Like we don't carry that anymore. There's a number of fresh fish that typically aren't going to have it, but then they're not as tasty, so people don't want those fish. What do we need to know about shrimp? Is there anything that we need to know about what's going on in the shrimp industry right now? Well, everybody always wants the wild shrimp, but it's another thing. They don't want the farm raised shrimp, but for all the same reasons, like, and especially more like a lot of my wild shrimp, um, my best wild shrimp is coming from Mexico, but nobody wants the stuff from Mexico, but I don't know why, like that's the best shrimp I have. Yeah. They want the U.S. wild shrimp, which is coming from parts where there have been a number of storms in those fisheries and those waters aren't the greatest. Like I'm yeah. going to take a farm raised shrimp first, then I'm going to take a Mexico shrimp and then I'll take a USA shrimp like last. Yeah, because the Mexico shrimp is coming from Baja down the coast, isn't it? It is, most of it. Some of yeah. it comes from deeper, but yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, the water is a lot better down in Baja than it is yes. on the coast. Yes, and, and off the East Coast. So why would you avoid that shrimp? So Mexican shrimp and uh, the farm-raised shrimp are great. I think also another issue is, is the, uh, the deveining. You know, everybody freaks out about the vein, this is not yeah. a vein, right? So to me, like, you know, it's an intestinal tract, right? And you know, being a chef, like it's it's purely aesthetics. Like you want to take that out because it doesn't look great. It's not in every shrimp, you know, some shrimp, it's not there, especially on a smaller shrimp. Um, and if there is the brown stuff in it, yes, that's waste that hasn't been evacuated yet because it's the digestive tract all the way through. But it has no taste. It has no ill effects for you. It's just part of the animal body. That's what I thought. And no texture. If you think about other animals, like if you think about chicken and lamb and beef, and you want you you technically want to be eating all of its parts. You want yes. the organ meat. Um, They're eating you know, that. You're not going to like take the chicken liver and like take everything out of the liver, wash it out, and then eat the lining. You you eat the whole thing. Correct. In so, order to get all the benefits. So yeah, to me that whole I don't think it's necessary to debate. And then they're like, oh there's one on both sides. There's not. So there's parts in that shrimp. It, it's a siphoning animal. So it's gonna siphon stuff through. So it's it's gonna sometimes be crunchy. It's gonna it withstand particles in there or it's gonna have that that digestive tract, but you're gonna cook it like you're good. Just cook it up and you're good. Now I hear down in Baja, like off the coast, oh. um, off the coast is where they have like gigantic pools in the ocean where they're farming the fish. Is that correct? Yeah, you don't even have to go to Baja. You can go to Carlsbad. Have you ever been to the Cannon outlets by Car Country yeah. Carlsbad? Yeah. Well, instead of turning left on Cannon, if you turn right and go down to the coast, that's where um, our Carlsbad uh, farm is, where we get some of our shellfish. So okay. you'll see those nets hang. You can take a tour for $30. It's an hour long. And you can see all the mussels and the clams. And then they teach you how to shuck the oysters. And you get to shuck some oysters. And you get to eat the oyster soup. It's, it's, it's a good thing. You should check it out. I will definitely go. That'll yeah. be some good education. Thank you. We do get some of our shellfish from them. Um, okay. Some of our, we're getting our mussels from them right now. We're not getting any oysters from them right now, but yeah. So everywhere you go, there people more and more, those are the nets that I'm talking about. They're just right in their natural habitat. Interesting. Yeah. It was years ago. I'm talking like over 10 years ago that I heard about the places down in Baja and a friend of mine was going to be investing in it. And I thought, you know, yeah. uh, he was ahead of his time in doing so, because obviously that is going to be the future of our it has to be. It absolutely has to be as things get weirder and weirder and dirtier and dirtier in our oceans. Yeah, no more fish. You're gonna have to farm them. Yeah, that we're gonna have farm. to. Yes, hopefully not forever. Just um, for for right now, as we figure out how to clean up our oceans and stop dumping. But 
we'll see how that goes. Yeah. You know, when I've traveled, that's where I've seen more of the farm fish in the shady tanks out in a, in a field. Like when I was, right. in, I was in Northern Vietnam in a small town in Northern Vietnam, a, a kind of a big tourist town. It was, um, it was founded by the French as a beautiful vacation area in Vietnam. So it has a lot of French influence, has the Vietnamese, it's right next to the border of China and a lot of Russians also vacation there. So you got a lot going on. Wow. And they had these tubs out in the middle of their rice fields with trout. <laughs> but I mean, they were the size of a traditional American swimming pool. They were not that big. So my brother and I just turned to each other and we thought, you know, not ordering any trout while we're in this part of Vietnam. Yeah, so that's what you, you'll see that stuff when traveling abroad. But you have to remember that anything that you get here, it doesn't have to meet the standards from that country. It has to meet the standards from our country. So if I'm getting it from Vietnam and it's in the tub, I can't get it because it doesn't meet our standard. So Got everybody... It. Each country has their own, you know, what they accept. And the United States is some of the most strict around. So if I'm getting it, even if it's coming from India or Asia, people are like, I don't want that one, it's from Thailand. Well, it's probably from a reputable Thailand source. It has to be. It's not from the one that was in the field that you saw. <laughs> so what, what should I be considering more of when I walk up to a seafood counter? What should I be purchasing or considering that not enough people are? I think the number one thing is the farm raised salmon, which is silly for me to say because it's my least expensive fish, right? Like you would think I'd be like, oh, you should buy the Chilean sea bass or whatever. But the truth is like health wise, I think you should be considering farm raised more. I think you should be considering keeping the skin on your fish more and not have people skin it. I think you should be considering the tail portion of the fish more. I think you should not be afraid of farm raised shellfish. Um, and I think, you know, you should stay away from things like that are called like sushi grade. That's one of those terms that, that you talked about in your paper, what terms are made up, yeah. that's a made up term. There's no such thing as that. And there's nothing <laughs> governed, you know, or regulated for sushi grade. Okay, so sushi grade tuna is just a marketing gimmick. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. It's so just tuna. It's just tuna. There's no particular part of the fish that I can cut and eat safely. That's not the case. The only way really to make it a sushi grade thing is for it to be frozen and to, for it to be frozen a certain way. You're talking about negative four degrees or colder for at least a week. Um, to kill any parasites. Your freezer at your house does not get that cold. It doesn't? It's typically, no, it's typically between zero degrees and 10 degrees. You should go check it. It's yeah. not negative four. So that's one thing. You can't be like, oh, I'll just take it home and freeze it myself. I'm not going to yeah. work. Um, and then also too, if you freeze it at a higher temperature, like negative 32 degrees, then you can get away with freezing it for like 48 hours. But there are very specific times and temperatures for these fish to kill the parasite. And then the only other way you're gonna kill it is to cook it to 145 degrees. Those are the only two ways. Yeah. So uh, people always ask for sushi grade fish and I, I'd say I don't have it. And well, the other store, they have it. They don't have it. Like, or I went to sushi, I know you did, but it wasn't sushi grade. It was either frozen previously. Oh no, it wasn't frozen. Well then I hope you trust your guy because you just ate raw fish and there's a chance you can get a parasite. Yeah. Like, you can eat anything in my case. When I was in the meat department, I was eating ground beef raw. You could eat it, but you're taking a chance. And like I said, you're taking a chance that I have kept that fish at the optimal temperature the entire time. And it didn't touch something else or rub up against another fish that had parasites. In my case, you've seen the case. Yeah. The fish are awfully close to each other. Well, and, and then your you're trusting. Are, are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You do a beautiful, beautiful job. Like the other day when I walked in, you guys had the stone crabs everywhere. It was just stunning. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I slapped those in there. Um, but yeah, but then you have to trust that you're taking care of it too. Like, are you keeping it at the right temperature? Like, yeah. there's so much that goes to it. Like, when you get it home and you put it in your fridge, you're getting ready to serve it to your friends. Like, has it been at the proper temperature then? And everybody always wants to ask for ice. 
like bring an ice chest with like an ice pack because I'll tell you right now, you yeah. don't want my ice. You That's don't want it in a bag. Yeah. You don't want it on top of your fish in a bag. You don't want my ice. Okay. I'm not making the greatest ice in the world. It's That's not really good to That's know. not what it's for, right? So everybody's like, oh, can I have a bag of ice? Now you got a plastic bag full of some weird ice slapped on top of your fish. You don't want that. That's good to know. I do always have an ice chest in my car yes. with ice packs. Absolutely. And I take the ice packs and I put them inside a zip, uh, a freezer Ziploc bag because the ice packs are actually delicate. And if you drop them, there'll be a crack and that goo will oh, come out and go yes. over your food. So I wrap them up just in case. And, and keep them in a Ziploc. That's a good idea. But yeah. yeah, you should bring, if you're concerned about the temperature of your products, bring an ice chest with some kind of ice pack in it. Yeah. It's, it's not hundred degrees outside. You're fine to go <laughs> But uh, if you're concerned, buy some frozen vegetables and put that on. Yeah, and the other thing that works really well is if you buy the frozen bone broth. Yes. That works incredibly well as a long-term ice pack. It does. Yeah. So bring ice. Don't get my ice. You don't want it. That is a really, <laughs> really good tip. Um, okay, so when I walk up to the counter and I see you guys have salmon burgers and you have the marinated fish, the crab cakes, are you guys doing all that? Some of it, yes, some of it, no. So uh, we started to get a crab cake that's already formed. It comes frozen. It's a really good product. I'm happy with it. So we do that. But for the most part, the marinated stuff you're seeing, that's us with the garnish. We get the marinades. Um, you know, we have that burger program. We're grinding our own uh, fish uh, or dicing it up, I should say. We don't put it in a grinder, but we chop it really fine and mix it with the breadcrumbs. And we have recipes that we make to make that. We're making our own pokey at the store now. Um, we've got some previously frozen salmon and, and tuna and octopus that we're using um, to make pokey. We're starting to do a big pokey program. But the majority of the oven ready stuff that you see we put together, we have lobster tails, that are marinated, you know, we have the marinated salmons and halibuts, and things like that, which is, again, it's, it's labor intense. We don't have a lot of people working there. Um, so it's time consuming. We have to make a lot of it. And then of course, all the ingredients have to match with the labeling and, and all that with allergies and stuff like that. So you have to be careful with that, but we're really good about that. And we have a pretty big selection of that. And what you should know about that is that when you see that you can get any of those products at my particular store, and I think so at every store, you can get any product that the marinade I have, you can get that put on your product. So like, you could be like, well, can I have some halibut with some of that teriyaki sauce on it? So you don't have to take what's in a case. You, you want something else marinated the way that you see some other marinade, then we can do that. So you can't be afraid to ask for something that might be cool that you want because we, we're gonna do it. So your poke bowls, all that fish was previously frozen in order to kill the parasites and then defrosted and tossed with fresh ingredients and citrus and anything else, soy sauce and put together. Is that how the poke bowls go? So you remember the poke bowls when we used to put them together like all the time with all the stuff on them, we don't do anymore. We just have sometimes in a pan. So uh, a while back, the, the tuna that we used was not previously frozen, it was just, yellowfin tuna you know kept in a temperature at one point uh i got audited we because we get audited every three or four weeks um and the auditor said well where's your certification for your tuna to say that it's safe to eat and i was like well that's a good question I, so i called you know i had to call around make some phone calls only to find out that no such thing exists and that we don't need to have it and oh, wow. it turned out that we didn't the only fish we needed to have it for was salmon. We had to be able to prove that the salmon was frozen uh, and then defrosted. That's what they use in the sushi on the Kika side. Um, so I thought that was odd. You know, I'm like, well, why would I be giving that to a customer? You know, it's not, it hasn't been frozen. Like, I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, so that was a, a few years ago, but just recently they just made a change. We're starting a new pokey program. And just recently they started sending us the cubes already, they come frozen to us and we slack it out. 
So that's new, but I don't think that's what happens typically. It's typically just, on, especially on a tuna, it's just cut up. We used to be able to just take tuna loins and cut them up and put them in there and sell them as pokey. So what do you think we're getting when we're going to a restaurant and getting um, pokey or tuna tartar? You know, let's say I'm going to Capitol Grill or Daily Grill or one of those kind of general big American, you know, restaurants. What are we getting previously frozen um, tuna for our tuna tartar? Or are they yeah. using fresh tuna? Like what are they putting in there and how do I know that it's actually safe to eat? Well, I think it depends on where you're going. And there's a lot of those um, those stores popping up, you know, around like the pokey places, pokey bowls. I think one, if it's if it's a nice cube and it's like a high-end kind of place, you're probably getting fresh tuna. If it's a place that is like a lunch crowd rush place where they have to go through a lot. And it's, have you seen the grinded kind? It looks like, like ground beef. Sometimes it's ground up pokey. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably frozen. So I would ask, you know, are, is this, you know, fresh tuna or has it been previously frozen? I would ask, but if it's bright red and it looks moist, it's probably fresh. Okay. And what okay. I want, because this is a new way of thinking, what I want is the frozen tuna because that way it will have killed the parasite. I mean, that's what I would want. If I'm going to yeah. eat it like that and you can, like I said, you'll probably never get a, parasite or a sickness from a fish in your lifetime it's not easy um but you can so why take a chance if you don't care about doing it go for it it's cool but if you're concerned about that one time it's always me that's why i'm concerned always that one time that one thing that happens is going to be me so i'm not going to take the chance so what are you actually purchasing from a fish and seafood department. What do you like to buy and take home and prepare for yourself? Well, the funny thing is I don't buy any fish and take any fish home uh, only because, well, a couple of reasons. Uh, I have a daughter who has some severe food allergies. And so there's certain things I can't even have in my home um, out of safety reasons. My wife, she doesn't eat any seafood um, and, and she doesn't like the smell of cooking seafood. So don't want that around. So, uh, I, I don't bring any fish home. I do try to, you know, every once in a while, my birthday was just last weekend and my oldest daughter took me to a seafood place. So we ate a whole bunch of different things because she knows like that's the only time I'm going to get to eat it. <laughs> yeah. So we ate a lot of different things. I like the shellfish. I like the oysters. Um, I like crab cakes. I like the sample of stuff. And then, but, you know, I kind of know what they're getting. So I know what I should get and I know what I shouldn't get. And we had some okay stuff, but I've, I found like fish restaurants to be kind that they've become like uh, not as good as before. Oh, yeah. I think there's less um, effort into getting the best product. Um, now they're just trying to get product to, to make, you know, to make the money, they have to make the money. And uh, no matter what, how good your chefs are in like, I went to a, what's it called? The King's Fish House. It used to be, it used to be really, really good. Um, and we found that, you know, some of the stuff was not, as great as it used to be before. So I think it's a product, a uh, product thing. They're getting a lesser quality product and um, they're spending less on how they prepare it because they have to make money. You know? Yeah, and people still aren't comfortable with higher prices, even though, right. you know, we're trying to educate people on what it takes to cost wise to send a group of people out on a boat to catch the fish properly yes. store it, bring it back. And then how many other hands that it goes through in order to distribute it and sell it to you or put it on your plate. Um, a lot of people touched it and supported that process, but yes. people are still expecting, you know, fast food prices. It's just and not going to work. It just doesn't make any sense. That's why we don't have the Bronzino right now because the fuel prices getting it from Greece Wow. they're so high and the worker shortage is so great that we can't get the product we've been yeah. trying and we just can't get it yeah is that why you guys have a lot of trout yeah that's that's why you see a lot of trout that's all right yeah. now i know it's freshwater fish is mm -hmm. good fish for me and i'm going to get more comfortable with the trout absolutely please do no i absolutely will um you know that's 
that's what I'm trying to challenge myself with this year is getting more comfortable cooking different types of fish and different cuts of fish and especially whole fish. Because my favorite thing when I eat out and when I travel is whole fish, you know, especially in Europe, in the coastal areas, they do such a great job of just grilling up a small whole fish. It's and really cost effective and you're not buying any of it. Terrible. I know, I know. I'm going to get on it. I'm going to get on it. I buy some little trout sometimes because my clients like some stuffed trout, but I want to work on it for myself um, and bring more of the seafood into, into my diet. Cause it really doesn't take much to prepare or cook. Um, no, it doesn't kind of have to, yeah, you just have to learn a few simple steps and you're good to go. Perfect. All right. So how do you stay warm when you work in such a cold <laughs> environment every day? I had to ask. You, you don't, you kind of have to get used to it. Okay. The going in and out of that freezer, our freezer is negative 20 degrees. Wow. in the back our cooler stays at about 30 degrees and then your hands are wet all the time so um you know going back and forth and I actually get kind of warm when I'm moving around a lot the cold people are the people that aren't working so you get, <laughs> I think I just got used to it over the years being in the meat department and being in yeah. food I'm wet and cold all the time and I like cold I do not like hot I do not like sun so I'm good with it other people are and it's not easy, an easy thing to get used to yeah. 3 30 in the morning in that freezer is no fun. That's amazing. Thank you for yeah. your work and helping. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, and that's what I'm excited for people to learn a little bit more about, you know, the people that are helping you eat the way you eat, you know, um, you know, I was, um, I was the pastry chef at a restaurant for a year and <laughs> I got in at five in the morning, you know, I'd see the coyotes in the canyon on the way to work at like oh, 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm well aware of that. Yeah. Um, so one other thing I just wanted to ask um, is how are you able to take care of yourself after you give and serve people all day? So you spend all day prepping right. food, answering any questions they may have and help them talk through what they're serving at dinner or how they're preparing something for a special event. You know, that's really taxing. What do you it do is. to like refill up with energy? Well, that's a really good question. And especially at, at a time like right now that I don't think folks know how difficult it has been for the food worker. Yeah. Like with all the COVID, like we haven't had a break. We didn't go home and work from home for six months, none of that happened. We were there, people are continuing to get sick on a daily basis. It's kind of scary being there sometimes because people in the store, your coworkers are sick or their families are sick. People are stressed out. You're yeah. dealing with customers who are stressed out. Um, and sometimes you don't, you know, you get treated poorly as a, as a food worker. So this time, especially, and I've been doing it for a lot of years, but the last few years have been very taxing and, and it's tough on not just me, all the people that are working there. And I don't think people realize how, how much of a beating that the food worker has gone through over the last couple of years. And yeah, it's tough. So then I come home um, talking about it or thinking about it. And I don't want to do that. You know, I want to have my own time. So you're right. You do have to try to find some time to wind down and just let it go and get ready to start the next day. But it does add up and it, it is taxing on us all for sure. Um, so remember that when you go into the, to the store, because it's not an easy time right now. It hasn't been for a while. It's still happening at our store. We're still having sick people. Um, and then we had to come home and kind of live our lives. It's not easy. Yeah. And there's still people that are going out to the grocery store that are still paranoid. It's very, yeah. you know, it's a crazy time. It is. And then they take out their, their fear on other people. And unfortunately, a lot of time on you guys. So thank you yeah. for showing up every day. I know, I know it's exhausting. It is. And a couple of things that we didn't touch on before we leave that I think are kind of important. Yeah. Is, is that Marine Stewardship Council. I don't know if you've ever seen those labels in our store. Yes. So, so that that company, the Marine Stewardship Council, they're like a nonprofit international organization that like fights to protect the ocean and the fisheries to make sure that the fish are healthy. Um, the fishing practices are are good and they're not destroying other habitats or other animals. And so any 
anybody that catches fish, they can be audited by the Marine Stewardship Council if they choose to be. Um, some people choose not to be. Um, they are a nonprofit, but they do get money from like, we, get, we give them money to put their label on our product that we have that is governed by them. But I don't know if you saw that Netflix, Netflix Seaspiracy show. I haven't of, watched it. They, they kind of make the Marine Stewardship Council look kind of bad and, and yeah. kind of fraudulent. And it very well could be, but at the very least, they're monitoring these fisheries and, and then they're labeling the fish that they've monitored to ensure that those fisheries are able to give back to the ocean and not deplete the fish. So if you're looking, if you're shopping, you know, and that kind of stuff matters to you, you can look for that blue MSC label. That's important. Um, also remember that the farm fish, fish although it's sustainable, um, we're feeding it fish. We're crushing a bunch of fish and crustaceans to feed it. So while that fish is sustainable, we are now taking away from another habitat. So maybe, you know, there's a catch 22 there. Yeah. And then also the mercury levels, everybody freaks out about. We have to make sure that you're aware of the mercury levels in the fish. Typically it's coming from the larger fish. The mercury is getting deposited in the oceans, um, typically from like coal burning factories and like chlorine producing factories. And it's coming mostly from the atmosphere down into the water. Um, the small fish are eating it. And of course the bigger fish are eating the smaller fish. So the bigger fish, the more mercury just because they eat more. So got it. And that's where it's coming from. So, so yeah, somebody's like, well, where's the mercury coming from? Yeah. It's not, it's not naturally found in the fish. It's because no. of our atmosphere. Yes, they're eating it. It's going into the oceans from mostly from the atmosphere from coal burning factories or chlorine producing factories, little big clouds go in the sky. The ocean is a huge you know, part of the world. So it goes in there and then they're eating that. So yeah, you want to avoid it, eat smaller fish, anchovies, sardines, trout. Yes. yes. Do you guys ever get anchovies or sardines in? We do. We, and we, we start to get them and then they go away. Like, I'm like, dude, the people want the, the, the sardines. I do have some marinated anchovies, but yeah, we usually get the smaller ones. And okay. we've been getting a lot of local fish too now, which is really good because the local fish um, it's going to have to travel less, but yeah. unfortunately local could mean San Francisco. Oh, okay. It doesn't mean uh, there's no radius to it. It just means there is a radius. It used to be a seven hour drive and now it's like, um, anything in California can be considered local. But my issue is, which is hilarious because that's the entire length of the East Coast. It's ridiculous. So that's like saying New Hampshire, but we just brought in local fish from the Florida Keys. Yes, exactly. That distance is the same. <laughs> My problem is why we can't put local on stuff we get from Mexico because it's a lot closer to me than San Francisco. Absolutely. Anything from the Baja or intercoastal area. That should be so local. Much, it's so much closer to us. Like part of that's a yes. two hour drive. Yes. So yeah, we're working on that yeah. right now because a lot of good seafood comes from Mexico. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Chris. I learned so mm -hmm. much. I hope so. I don't know if we got to everything you wanted to get to, but hopefully. And I better see you buying a trout. Yes, next for myself. <laughs> for myself. And then we'll, we'll also be getting more sardines and anchovies. Um, yes. I'm, I'm going to change a lot of things up, I think. Um, before we leave today, is there anything else that you would like to share um, that you think we should know about ordering fish or that we can consider um, just in improving, you know, the foods that we choose or our experiences when we walk into a grocery store? Sure. I think it's just important to, to have a plan when you go to the store and know what you want. Oftentimes the customer asks, you know, points at one thing and says, give me that tilapia, but they're, what they're pointing at is not tilapia. So always <laughs> it blows my mind. You don't even know what it looks like, what you want. So like, you should know what you want yeah. and ask questions. The, the fish monger should not be afraid to answer your questions. If ask questions about how to prepare, where it came from, you know, was it frozen before? Things like that. Always ask those questions, come in prepared, bring that ice chest, which is super important. And you know, I would do that all the time. Yeah. And um, just try to educate yourself on the fish that you're going to prepare and serve to your family, especially if you have young children and what you have, you have to know what it is that you want. 
Are you looking for health benefits? Or are you just looking to fill their tummies? Are you looking to save the earth? There's a whole bunch of reasons we buy fish. So you need to know what your reason is. If it's just to eat, then buy whatever you want. If you want to shop green, you need to know what you need to get. If, if you're looking for omega-3s, you need to know. So it's important to know why you're buying the fish you buy. These are such good tips, Chris. You are a wealth of information. I really, oh, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I, I like your little rock back there. Oh, thank you. This is, <laughs> this is my uh, Arkansas quartz crystal. Okay. I got this one as a birthday gift. So I love this little guy. And this is my cute new little plant. <laughs> Hi, little plant. We love you. <laughs> well, that's a good setup. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time, Chris. I really, really sure. appreciate it. And um, hopefully, you know, people can, can listen and learn. And then um, if they have more questions about seafood, maybe we can drag you back on. Sure. Have, have them do that. Absolutely. One other thing, yeah. tell them to ask their fish counter person, what days they get their fish. Yes. That's kind of important. Yes. And so um, where I shop, what days do the fish come in? All the fish, excluding the tilapia and the farmed salmon, comes every day with the exception of Thursday and Saturday. OK. Good to know. And I'll yeah. start asking at other places I shop as well. Thank you. Yeah, do that. But remember the fish that didn't come, it's probably just as old as the fish that came the day before the fish that came there. It was in the warehouse. Yeah, I got but it. Not for months or weeks, but, but for at least for a day. Yeah. <laughs> I will not use the term, term fish uh, fresh anymore. I have learned. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> no fresh. Is it fresh? And no Sushi grade. Yes. Yes. Take those out of your vocabulary. Gone. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank and, you. Uh, I, I will see you soon. You enjoy hopefully a day or two off. Yes. Tomorrow I will not go to work. Okay. Fantastic. And I'll right. see you on uh, Sunday or Monday. Perfect. Bye. Bye.